Major funding for this production is provided by American Bank of Lafayette, the financial choice of the 80s. Additional funding provided by the Friends of LPB. I've got a boyhood friend from Lafayette, where I come from, named Roland Laurel. And his whole life is built around food and wine. In other words, he's a typical Frenchman. When I told him who my guest was today, uh, it was the same thing as if I had told him that I was interviewing uh, President Reagan, or bigger than President Reagan, because my guest is the great Cajun chef, Paul Prudhomme. Monsieur Prudhomme, comment ça va? Ça va bien. Good. Thank you so much for coming from New Orleans here to Baton Rouge to do this program with us during the holiday season. C'est un plaisir pour être ici avec vous autres. Oh, I don't comprends, but I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it was the right thing. It's the, a pleasure being here, it really is. Paul, the first thing that strikes me is you look like a chef. Now, I would not mistake you for an undertaker. I would not say that you sold insurance. You might be a politician, but definitely you look like a chef. Well, I, I feel like a chef, and a lot of times I act like a politician, so <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Paul, your beginning was uh, quite remarkable. You started out in a town I dearly love, Opelousas. Tell us about those early years. Well, I was, I was um, the last of 13 children. Uh, I was born on a sharecropper's farm. My, my father was Eli Prudham, and uh, senior. And my mother was Hazel Reed Prudhomme. And um, we lived in between Port Barron and Opelousas, a little bit off of, uh, a little bit off the highway there, and uh, right next to the swamps. And uh, that's where I was born and raised. When I was a young uh, person, when I was 12 years old, we moved to the city, had a grocery store. And uh, so all my first part of my life was, uh, was really evolved around food because uh, when I was, I think about seven years old. Uh, my youngest sister, Enola, got married, and there was no one left to help mother, and she had to produce a lot of food. You know, we had to. We didn't have any refrigeration. We had an ice box. You know, you put a chunk of ice. Sure. In, you know? And uh, so we had to do all our canning and all our preserving, and uh, we'd do all our smoking, making sausage and boudin, all those things. Then when we moved to the city in the grocery store, we had a butcher shop. So again, we did all those kind of things. And so it was, it was sort of preparing me. I didn't know that at the time, but it was sort of preparing me for, for my future profession. And for some reason, you know, sometimes things happen, you don't know why, but I remember thinking about wanting to be a cook. I remember thinking about uh, being all dressed in white, you know, with a big high hat on. And uh, I'd heard of a cousin. I, I guess I was about eight or nine years old. I heard of a cousin that was in the service. And he was working in New Orleans as a chef in one of the hotels. And uh, they said at the time, this was 52, 53, he's making $800 a month. And boy, that just seemed oh like a lot goodness. of money. I could see him standing in his big white hat, you know, and making $800 a month. But that was the, the only sort of brush mentally I had with cooking as a profession. And when I was 17, I had to decide on doing something for a living. And I knew the grocery store business, and I thought about going into that. And then all of a sudden, a uh, second cousin, Colville Lafleur, who is from Opelousas, uh, made me a deal that he would build a, a building and rent it to me to have a restaurant. And so we did. Uh, we designed the building and built it. It's on the airport highway going to Ville Platte. And it was called Big Daddy O's Patio. And it just promptly Big went. Big Daddy O's Patio. <laughs> that's true. Now, you did something else you told me at the same time you opened that restaurant. Well, that's, that's a little story we were talking about before. And, and what, what it was was I, I got married. I got the restaurant and got it all ready to open, and got married and went on a big honeymoon, went to Galveston. Of course, Galveston. <laughs> and uh, 
my wife was from uh, my ex-wife was from Sunset, and we came back to uh, to Opelousas and opened the restaurant. And uh, nine months later, I was broke and owed money to the bank, and I didn't have a wife, so <laughs> I decided I better concentrate on one thing. I couldn't handle two and a wife at a restaurant because restaurants are very demanding. They're very, very demanding occupation. It's, it's probably, uh, out of research done, it's the single most personal demanding uh, occupation there is because as you rise in the restaurant business, you have to actually put in more time. I put in more time into my job today than I did when I was 22 years old because then you'd work 8, 10, 12 hours and it was over. Now it's 16-hour days and it's every day. You know. What I mean? Okay, the restaurant in Opelousas, Big Daddy's Patio, and I can't see how a restaurant with that name didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it went under. That's right. And uh, you head out for New Orleans. That's right. I, I went Were to New Orleans. Were you scared going to the big town like that? Were you, uh, did you have some trepidation? I guess so. I don't, that, that is not very clear to me. I probably was a, a little apprehensive, but I've always been an adventuresome. I think I'm an unusual Cajun and, and a very unusual prudent because the family's all around Opelousas, you know. But I always, I love to travel. I mean, to get in my car and to hit the road is just wonderful, you know. I mean, I just, I've enjoyed that all my life. And going to New Orleans was, was an adventure, you know. And uh, at that time, that was a long way to go. I'd only been in New Orleans maybe half a dozen times. How I had many a brother times had there. you been in a restaurant, a real restaurant? Boy, not many. Because my dad, my dad, I mean, it just didn't make sense to him that mother was such an incredible cook. Yeah. That why you go spend two dollars for food and she can make it home for a nickel. You know, maybe he can grow it all. You know, and so there wasn't uh, the the what I think I had been a Swallows Dinner Club, maybe. Um, Maybe a half dozen times, and I had, <laughs> I had been, I had been to the to the back door of, um, of Daddy's, getting ducks and duck and dirty rice, you know. When I was a kid, a couple of times we'd done that, and I had been to, uh, there was a burger chef I think there was in in the hometown then or something. It was a hamburger place, and I'd been to that a half a dozen times, but I just did not. We did not go to restaurants, you know, and and the family still don't go out. I uh, recently had one brother take the other one out to dinner. And he came to Lafayette and had the steak dinner. And the one brother that paid for it was, you know, I mean, he's been out before. He's a businessman and he's out in the world. The other brother felt <laughs> that he had paid $9 for the steak that he could have gotten and fixed for three, right? <laughs> and it wasn't as good as it would have been at home. And he still talks about that. I mean, you know, and that's the way the family feels about going out. So, so. you get to New Orleans and what do you do for a living? Well, I, I, I went to the uh, at then Roosevelt Hotel. It's now the Fairmont. And uh, I figured the easiest way to do it is to just get a job in the kitchen. And they had a job open as a pot washer. I did that for about a, two weeks, three weeks. And they had a, at that time, it was a huge kitchen. And they had what they call a vegetable room. And they had one chef that did nothing but fix vegetables. And so and I'd finish washing my pots and I'd go help him peel vegetables because you know, I like to keep busy. And so he asked the chef to put me in the vegetable room. And I was there for a while. Then I went on to what we call the line, actually cooking for the dining room. And I was there a little more than a year. I worked for the Brennan family for a while, and then I left the city. And I traveled for 12 years from Chicago all the way to San Francisco, learning about other kinds of food. Folks, uh, uh, Paul is kind of passing over that uh, working for the Brennans. Uh, he was their executive chef. And just to let you know that uh, uh, this was no just executive well, chef. It was that, just like, that was the second time. Oh, right? second. All right, go ahead then. I'm getting ahead. <coughs> yeah, the Excuse first me. time, the first time yeah, I just, I worked. It's such a good story. Go yeah. ahead. And what, I'd, what I would do is I'd work in restaurants, and I, I would find that the food wasn't very good, but, you know, I'm learning, so I, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and I'm trying to make it good, and, and they won't let me. See, I'm trying, <laughs> trying to put a little pepper in it, and they don't want to hear that, right? And so what I'd do then is I asked to cook for the, for the employees, because uh, every restaurant has what they call a, uh, an employee meal, you know. And so I'd ask to do that, and so I'd fix Cajun food for them. And man, I'm telling you, I was wonderful because they were excited about it. And, you know, I became sort of the secret hero of the restaurant because, <laughs> you know, you, you feed a bartender good. And if you want to, you know, if you want a glass of, of beer, it's instant, you know, Why I mean, you get it. so it was it was kind of a little power trip there. You know, I mean, I'd go to work some ways and say, I'll cook for the help, you know. And uh, so that was that was fun. It was it was a learning thing because later on in life, I found out that the hardest people to please with food were the waiters or the waitresses, because 
you know, they traveled around, they worked different places, and they realized that uh, what food is and had seen, you know, lots of good food and lots of bad food. When they could get excited about the employee meal, um, I knew, I started indicating, I started feeling there was an indication there was something different about our food. There was something uh, emotional about it that all other foods, I'd work with European waiters and, you know, I mean, they would just fall all over themselves when they would eat Louisiana food. And it was my first real feeling that maybe here we had something that was really different. And then you v gradually worked your way back to New Orleans. Is that right? Yeah. I, uh, I, I tried the restaurant business again as, a, as an owner. Matter of fact, uh, uh, the truth is I went broke four times before I had a successful restaurant. And uh, each time I'd learn, I'd learn a little something else. You know, and and uh, the hardest thing was to learn was I got it down where I could serve good food. But I couldn't make money, couldn't you know. Money, no. And I, well, truth is, I made it, but I spent it. I didn't understand how to do money. And then I had a couple of successful restaurants, and uh, I had one in Aurora, Colorado, and it worked very well. We had it for about uh, about eight nine months, and got really busy. And the guy came along and offered me a bunch of money, and so I gave it to him and left, you know. And uh, but I worked the mountains in Colorado. I worked in Las Vegas, and what were your eyes always <coughs> on coming back home to? To Louisiana? Well, in the beginning it was. In the beginning I was just a young kid having a good time, you know. But as I got 23, 24, 25, and I'd come home, and it was just so wonderful to come home. And it was so wonderful to, to go by where I was raised and, you know, to kind of stand and hear the noises in the swamps. And, and I felt, I felt when I was away from home, you know, I'm a very relaxed person, you know. I mean, it's very hard to upset me. And, but when I was away from home, I was easy to upset and was just a little tight, you know. And I'd come home, and each time I'd want to stay longer, you know. And then something happened probably in, uh, in the time when, when we, think of, we think back in, in the history of people and we think of the, the hippie era. And I was in the mountains in Colorado, and I seen a lot of intelligent young men and women that were striving for two or three things. But basically, they were striving for family because they'd get a bunch of them and they'd live in the same house and you'd look at it from the outside and you think, my God, those are immoral people. And, but if you looked at it from the inside, uh, it wasn't that. They wanted a family. I mean, they, they, their mother was working, their father was working, you know. And, and to belong. They, yeah, and they, they, they left home, they went out on their own, they didn't, they didn't like that, so they would band together as a group so they'd have a family unit. And they were striving to do things that was what they felt was right uh, to get back to the earth, you know, help food, uh, not putting chemicals and things. And there was some contradictions because, you know, they would do dope, which I didn't understand at all. And then they would say, you know, don't put chemicals in my food. But that was a, that was a, a real transition for me because it all of a sudden dawned on me that we had a tremendous amount of intelligent people that I felt right about that was doing a thing that I believed in. And that's the way I was raised. You know, I mean, all of a sudden it dawned on me that what they were striving for, I had all my life, Very you know. I had a wonderful family. I mean, we, we fought hard against each other, but, boy, don't mess with us because we were all together then, you know. And, and we loved each other, and, you know, I mean, it was a, we had a wonderful family. And we had this wonderful food that, that made us live and gave us party atmosphere. And when we got together, you know, I mean, everybody brought a bowl of something, and, you know, we made big gumbos. I mean, it was just, it was this wonderful, warm feeling. And to me, that's what Cajun is. You know, that's what Louisiana is all about. And I realized coming home that some of that was starting to slip away. The languors were slipping away. Everybody was buying freezers. And, you know, we'd go out to the fishing hole. We used to go out every day, you know, every other day. Mother said, we want some fish. So they'd go out and we'd get some fish and bring them home and cut them up and eat them. And it was super. But now, all of a sudden, you know, they're going out and they're getting a bunch of fish and put it in the freezer, you know. And, and I knew that was wrong because it, it just don't taste the same and it's not as good for you. And, but all those things were happening, I thought that maybe if I came home and I really made an issue of our food and I knew I could cook, uh, I knew that mother had taught me how to cook and I'd learned professionally and I could put all those things together. And uh, I just knew I had to come home and do something. I had to make people feel that uh, what we had was a very important thing. You were a man with a mission. You really were. Yeah, I guess I was. I guess so, I am. Paul, you uh, ended up uh, uh, as executive chef uh, at Commanders and at some of the Brennan's other properties. 
Well, let me, let me tell you a little but, story. About uh, we've got a time limitation. <coughs> I, I want to tell some of All the right. very important things. Okay. You, you could talk, and you're fabulous for six weeks, but we've only got about 28 minutes. Okay. All right. And the point that I want to make is, while you were executive chef, uh, Commanders was chosen by Playboy magazine as the finest restaurant in New Orleans and among the 25 best restaurants in the United States. That's true. That's an incredible uh, accomplishment. Now, uh, then uh, you decided to, uh, again, you've gone under now, according to you, four times. You decide another shot, another restaurant. And you open this peculiar K Paul's, isn't that correct? Now, that was also a struggle to get going, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, it was a struggle in the sense that, that I was still had my job as the executive chef of Commanders, and I couldn't attach my last name to it, Prudum. Uh, I couldn't let anybody know that it was mine, and it was basically open as a luncheon place for my wife to run. And the reason it's called K Paul's is because my wife's name K, and so we just put our names together. And we were doing a do Louisiana food, so, and it was a it was kind of a place that I could go and cook because my job that I had with the Brennan family was an executive position, and I didn't get in the kitchen very much. And so I would go there early in the morning and cook, and and then she would come a little later and serve it, and I'd go on to my job. And so in the contents that we wasn't putting a lot into it. Uh, it was a, it was a struggle to get going. I mean, there was a couple of times we thought of uh, we thought of getting rid of it. You know, matter of fact, we sat and talked to it. I'll never forget. It was been uh, several months that we owned the place, and and uh, Kay had never gotten a paycheck. You know, and everybody else that's working is making money, but she didn't. And uh, I met her one day, and she was outside at the restaurant, and I pulled up, and we start talking, and she looked at me, and and she said uh, to me, she said, "I thought you said this was going to be fun." <laughs> She said, I've never gotten a paycheck. And I, I decided at that point that we had to, that I'd start using my knowledge and abilities. Make a and, real commitment to yeah, it. Yeah, and really make this restaurant go. Paul, I want the folks to share something that you told me before we went on the air. Uh, you and Kay have been married for about two years. Please tell our, our friends who are watching this program who does the cooking at the Food on Home. <laughs> now, this is well, the best cook in America, <laughs> folks. At the house, Kay does 90% of the cooking. And where is she yeah. from? She's from... <laughs> <laughs> She's from a little town in northern Montana. That's a, that makes me a little suspicious about all that Cajun <laughs> cooking. This man's eating Montana food well, at home. Well, that's, 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 see, that's the second thing to that is that uh, Kay and I have known each other for 10 years, and I've taught her how to cook, so. What is, and I, you get asked this all the time, what is the Prudhomme approach to cooking? Is it unique? What makes I Paul Prudhomme, what, what, what sets you apart from everybody else, makes you the best? Well, I love it. I think anybody that really honestly just loves what they do and strive to understand it is going to have a good product, no matter if it's building a tire or making an ashtray or whatever it is. And, and I, I approach it every day as, as wanting to do the best that I can with it, learning from yesterday and uh, trying not to repeat the mistakes you did before. But most of all, I think from my background as, as, a, as a young man, from my mother teaching me taste and from my father teaching me how to grow things, and then the understanding that if you take something off of a vine or out of the earth or if you take something fresh and cook it, you have a tremendous uh, advantage over everybody else. You know, I, I got a, when I was, you know, as a professional cook, I'd get these little red potatoes. And I'm telling you, I worked for two years trying to make them taste the way Mama did, you know. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, we used to go dig them and she'd carry them home in the apron. You know, and we'd put them in a pot and cook them. So I got some really fresh ones, and they were wonderful. <laughs> Had nothing to do with cooking, you no. know. They was just because they were fresh. And that's pretty much my approach now. What I do is I try every day to get a better product than us to, to start with than the day before. And, you know, we don't have a freezer at the restaurant. We don't freeze anything. And uh, we don't have heat lamps to keep food hot when it's, when it's finished cooking. We put it on a plate and we serve it. And we don't do reservations. We don't do a lot of things at a restaurant. But everything that we do is specifically pointed at making the food its best. When all my years through the restaurant and all my failures and successes, you learn things. And I tried to take away everything that interfered with the food being good. And I don't think that people who really enjoy food care if the uh, table is slanted or the chairs or whatever. And, uh, you know, if it's a paper napkin, I mean, you don't come into a restaurant to, to have a fancy napkin if you want to eat. Paul, you know. what's the difference in Cajun and Creole cooking? I think the heritage is different, and the heritage is very important. Creole food is, is a thing of its own. 
Uh, Creole food is, is the, the cop in so many cultures. There were several, seven different flags over New Orleans. It was, you know, and all the people that came and went into the history of the city of New Orleans left people behind. And a lot of them obtained a lot of wealth, and they had people work in their homes. And the people that would work over in the homes would work for a French family or an Italian family or a Yugoslavian family. They had to cook for those people the way they taste. But yet, when they worked for the next family, they had learned something there, and they started combining those things. And over a 200-year period, they created a whole new kind of cooking, where Cajun food is basically old French cooking with Louisiana products. It's 400-year-old French cooking. The brown roux is something that, that was actually an Italian cooking uh, 12, 1,500 years ago that the French used for three or four or 500 years, and they sort of dropped out of their cooking. And, but it's still in ours because, you know, we have that heritage. Can, can anybody learn to be a good cook? Or is, it a, is there a certain point then where you either have it? I think anybody can cook good food. I think that, uh, that, that a limited number of people can put themselves into the pot. And I'll tell you, I crawl right in under the fish and fry with it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. Uh, New Orleans, which is known as a city of great restaurants, are there great restaurants in, 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 in this year in, in, in New Orleans? Is it, is, is Absolutely. There yes. still are great Absolutely. We have some of the best neighborhood restaurants and, and some of our grand restaurants. Uh, you know, you, you talked about Commander's Palace. That's a wonderful restaurant. Uh, it's a wonderful s way to spend Saturday or Sunday or have dinner in this elegant restaurant. Uh, we have history in restaurants. We have restaurants that have been there for 150 years. And we have Galatoire's, which is still a wonderful restaurant. Plus, we have hundreds of neighborhoods. I'll tell you one thing that's happening that's just wonderful. There's a lot of neighborhood, I mean, there's a lot of chefs that are opening restaurants in the different neighborhoods. And some of my kids that I've trained are starting to grow up. Right? And matter of fact, uh, there's one of them that his father opened the restaurant uh, about four months ago. And uh, he's cooking for them, and they're doing super. I mean, they that really... That seems to give you pride. Oh, that's wonderful. What are you talking about? That's my kid. You know, I mean... You know what I love is when you go to New Orleans, there's a long line at two restaurants standing out if it's winter, summer, if it's raining. It one's at, at, at fabulous, famous Galatoire's right. with the perfect silverware and crystal, and the other long line is at your restaurant at Cape Falls. That, that, that's always a wonderful sight. There's always a line. Would you faint if you looked out that window and there wasn't? You'd probably spoil I fainted. Out. I fainted quite often. If, <laughs> I would have fainted quite often. If that, that's, you know, the reputation sometimes is, is stronger than the reality. And there is sometimes it's not a line. But one of the things that's so marvelous to see people that care enough about what you're doing that they're willing to stand out in a cold wind. Or, you know, I, I remember one time two and a half years ago that it started raining really hard, and I said, you know, we get as many people in as we can, but, you know, I mean, you can't get them all in. <clears throat> so I said, I guess they're going to leave, and I walked outside, and we had put out, you know, every afternoon we put out the garbage, and they had taken the boxes, the empty boxes from the garbage, and they were standing against the building next door, and they were holding boxes goodness, over their head, and they didn't leave, and it was just, what you a know, compliment. it just makes your heart feel so good, you know, I mean, you feel bad that they're out there standing in the rain, when you go but, to other people's restaurants occasionally, when you go to eat at the, uh, other chefs, are you a total intimidating force? Does the chef get nervous when they hear Paul Prudhomme's off front? Uh, I, it, would, it would scare the heck out of me, I must well, tell you, where they I shouldn't, They shouldn't be scared because, uh, you know, a, a reputation is a reputation is a reputation. I mean, there's, I'm no different a human being than I was, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And I love to eat. I'm a cook, you know, and, and I enjoy every kind of food, you know, I mean, I enjoy just simple home cooking and, and I enjoy all kind of restaurant food. But when you read about something and you watch, watch people on television, you read about them, you see the picture all over the place and a lot of people talk about it. Yes, it does intimidating. It's very disappointing to me that people react that way. I would, I, that's one of the bad things about, about, about being it. Paul Prudhomme. That's right. Uh, what about, about being this, Chef Paul. What about Chef Paul? What about <laughs> this? Uh, Paul Prudhomme is a different guy. He's Chef another Paul guy, is, the Chef yeah, Paul. Chef Paul I got, I've met two people today. <laughs> I like them both, I must tell you. Thank What's you. this plantation cooking school that I've read that, that, that you're considering? What, what is it? Well, that? one of the reasons for coming back to Louisiana was to try to establish a school that would uh, help retain our past culture with food. Uh, with a lot of things, with the music, with, you know, all-encompassing. But I wanted to be first the thing with cooking. And my idea is that the, 
we have very creative young people in this country that are becoming cooks. Very creative, very educated. It's just wonderful. I mean, the American chef, and especially the chef from Louisiana, is going to be the chef in the world market in the next 10 years. You know, and it's just, it, it, I could talk about that for a long time because there's so many of them. But the idea was to give the young man or woman that had been cooking for a while and that was raised in the city and had never seen a chicken walking or didn't realize that they, you know, they got to eat corn in order to get big, you know, the chickens do. And, and to realize, to, to be able to select and understand how products grow because without the sun and without the, the minerals from the earth, you know, nothing happens. I mean, you need that warmth and that heat from the sun to make things good. And you can do it chemically, but it don't work. It's not as good. It's not, uh, I mean, I don't think it's as good for you. But the idea was to, to have them work in the field, in the vegetable gardens, and let them raise carrots, and let them realize that a carrot this big that's raised naturally tastes better than one that's this big, and, you know, it's pumped full of uh, whatever they do to them. And uh, the idea was to, to be able to look at a chicken and say, now that's a good chicken, opposed to that chicken was raised in, in unnatural oh, conditions. Are you going to be able to start at this school? Oh, I, it'll, it'll happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. I want to tell our friends something interesting about you, uh, Chef Paul. When President Reagan hosted seven heads of state, 40 ministers at the Williamsburg Summit, he turned the food over to Craig Claiborne, who is the illustrious food critic and uh, commentator on food of the New York Times. I'd say uh, Craig Claiborne until his retirement uh, uh, recently was perhaps the name, at least in, in journalistic cooking. That's true. So Craig Claiborne said, I'm going to give these world leaders and these ministers the best food that the United States of America has to offer right now. And who did he ask to come and cook for these world leaders? He asked Paul Prudhomme, who didn't make it in that restaurant of Opelousas, and who is today Chef Prudhomme, the very, very great chef. What an honor and a thrill that must have been for you. You know, you go through life and you, you think, well, if I could only get there and do this, it would be wonderful. You get there and do that, and it isn't wonderful, you know? Well, I mean, it's, it fall, but this was incredible. I mean, it was beyond expectation to be there. And We're about out of time. I want to thank you so much for sharing uh, uh, not only a little about this uh, mystical world of uh, uh, culinary delight, but sharing Paul Prudhomme, who I find to be a very, very a charming and intelligent man, and a man who I think loves humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We love you, Louisiana. Major funding for this production is provided by American Bank of Lafayette, the financial choice of the 80s. Additional funding provided by the Friends of LPB.